This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From beautiful design templates and custom domains to full-blown e-commerce, email campaigns, and powerful analytics that you can set up in minutes, Squarespace is the place to go for all of your website needs. Let's suppose the 8K internal recording, IBIS-enabled Canon EOS R5, is everything it is implied or hoped to be based on last week's development announcement. Which is to say, a camera with specs that blow everyone out of the water without any of the crippling footnotes we've come to expect. Like... Uh, cropped video modes. Pixel binning, line skipping. Limited or no autofocus for certain resolution frame rate combinations like contrast detect only, no IAF, or no continuous AF. Awkward button combinations to initiate video. A wonky multifunction bar. Electronic IBIS. You get the idea. It would be a technological tour de force, a powerful proof statement that Canon is back and Canon is serious. It would obliterate, at least for video, at least in theory, at least based on what Canon has revealed thus far, anything extant from Sony, Panasonic, or Nikon. Or Leica. Think of it as a superior autofocusing, higher resolution, higher frame rate, smaller, lighter, Panasonic S1H with a wider array of native lenses. An ergonomically superior, higher resolution, higher bit depth, greater chroma sampling, higher frame rate video recording Sony A7 III, maybe A7R III, with a flippy screen, and, at least to some of us, more interesting glass. A superior autofocusing, dual card slot and flippy screen equipped, superior video recording Nikon Z6, possibly Z7. Maybe. Hold that thought. Or, maybe, a more practical, more fully developed, superior video spec, superior autofocusing, more accessibly priced like a SL2, without that storied brand's heritage, panache, or feel, it's true, but with a broader and deeper and more accessibly priced yet no less performant lens ecosystem. Maybe. Hold that thought. We're talking about a Halo product. A strut Possibly a gut punch to higher-end dedicated video cameras from Canon itself to Sony, Panasonic, maybe Red, possibly even Arri. Call it a Charles Atlas comic book strongman kick sand in the face moment to the entire industry. In fact, the specs are so outrageously beyond anything else out there. That reminds me of nothing so much as a Bugatti Veyron. Eight liters of 16-cylinder, 1,000-horsepower Go Juice, capable of 0 to 60 in 2.46 seconds, top speed of 267.856 miles per hour, and lateral acceleration of 1.4 Gs. And, as it happens, never mind the seven-figure price tag, a thirst for fuel that amounts to 1.4 gallons per minute at top speed. Holy crap. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today I want to talk about Canon's EOS R5 development announcement. If the R5 really turns out to be all that and a bag of potato chips, it will be a good thing. It will be a good thing because I think it's important for Canon to be in the game. It will be a good thing because Canon has its own rich legacy to preserve. It will be a nice thing, because a Canon FTQL actually was my first serious camera. My Canon 1D, the instrument used to capture the World Trade Center Light Memorial in 2002 from across the East River while walking along the Brooklyn Promenade. My Canon 5D2, the camera I no longer have, the camera that brought me to YouTube. But the hype around the R5's 8K video spec has been so massive that when it comes to the actual camera, the question... I keep asking myself is, so what? And that is because the very first question we might ask potential buyers, the same kind of question I'd want to ask Veyron owners, how often do you intend to run flat out? In other words, how many people would record regularly at 8K? 
to be shared with whom, edited on what, displayed on what. My suspicion, and I could well be wrong, I've been wrong before, I'll be wrong again, is that the answer would be about the same, some variant of just about no one, on almost nothing, almost never. Except, of course, for big screen, big budget, wildlife, sports, and landscape filmmakers, though even then, probably not with a hybrid camera not specifically designed for, say, IMAX theaters, or network coverage of the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Eh... Never mind. It's a variant of the same question I always ask whenever queried about upgrading to the latest version of Name That Camera. What can you do with it that you need or want to do and cannot do with what you've already got? Let's put into perspective the arrival of 8K in a hybrid camera compared to other innovations over the past half decade. Take, for example, moving from DSLRs to mirrorless cameras. Now, that made sense to me. In fact, I did just that back in 2014 or 15, I can never remember, for a very specific set of reasons. First, I just couldn't manually focus well enough nor see through the viewfinder at all when recording video on my Canon 5D Mark II. The absence of an articulating screen was a pain as well. Second, the Mark II's 1080 video was revolutionary. But as a photographer, it looked soft to me. It's why I tried a Panasonic GH2, but ultimately switched instead to a Sony A6000 after more than 40 years shooting Canon, giving up nothing in the way of stills image quality either. In fact, I judged the Sony A6000 crop sensor camera to be superior. Over the next two years, we upgraded to the A6300 for 4K because I could see and appreciate the difference in image quality. But I could never get past the 15 minutes or so on the A6300 because of overheating firmware updates or not. In 2017, we decided we had to have reliable unlimited 4K recording for hours on end and wanted class-leading IBIS not only for our YouTubing, but for our documentary work. This is why we added a Panasonic GH5 and Micro Four Thirds glass to our kit the day the GH5 became available. And it quickly became our ACAM with its vastly superior ergonomics. Two years later, we replaced the A6300 with the A6400, finally having a reliable two-camera video setup that would take advantage of the glass we already had. These crop sensor cameras not only offered superior video image quality, they also tick our boxes for portability and value with, again, little to no compromise. This was because A, we almost always light our scenes and shoot at or near base ISO. B, we rarely rely on autofocus, and when we did, either the GH5 would be good enough or we still had our Sony. And C, we'd have all the shallow depth of field we'd need for what we do. In early 2020, I added the weather-sealed full-frame 47-megapixel Leica SL2 with Summicron SL35 as my personal camera for street photography work, even though at the time its video specs exceeded everything in the hybrid space, save for the Panasonic S1H. I was determined to make do with one camera lens combination for my personal work. I wanted to capture the full richness of New York City's textures using a lens without compromise. I wanted to shoot with abandon in the rain at night, ambient light only. I wanted to shoot with what made me happy. I wanted to shoot in the no futzing zone. And... When necessary, I wanted to be certain I could crop the crap out of an image and restore perspective in post, both in service of creating something I otherwise could not, at least not without floating 100 feet in the air with a much bigger lens. Though, I might not have gotten the SL2 if Claudia hadn't made the Leica CL I first acquired in 2019 her own. But, AK video, for what we do, for what makes us happy? Irrelevant. I'd rather have an internal variable electronic neutral density filter or an internal variable electronic neutral density filter. Okay, lighted legible physical controls would be nice too. These are the kinds of things that would make a difference to us almost every day. But it has to be said, the absence of these things doesn't keep me from getting the footage I want. Which, by the way, makes the simultaneous announcement of Canon's EF mount, Super 35, 4K only recording, 
Cinema ES300 Mark III, so very, very interesting. But hold that thought while I give a quick shout out to the outstanding team behind Squarespace.com. With their elegant layouts, click drag and drop interface, customization tools, and excellent support, they make it a cinch for photographers and content creators, really any small to mid-sized business in any industry, to have an outsized presence on the web. And that has never been more important than now. Squarespace.com can literally have you up and running in minutes with a beautiful website and custom URL tailored to the way you want to present yourself. They really understand what it takes to build your online identity and grow your business. When you're ready to move beyond your basic site, Squarespace.com has you covered with their fully integrated platform. We know. Not only do we use Squarespace.com for our production company, blog, documentary, and personal photography sites, we've integrated email blasts and commerce. We book our street photography workshops and now sell our brand new Streets of New York, the book, through our Squarespace sites. It all just works. So hop over to Squarespace.com slash Hugh for a free trial and get an extra 10% off your first website or domain when you're ready to really give it a go by using the discount code HUE. Again, that's squarespace.com slash HUE and discount code H-U-G-H at checkout. I want to thank the good folks at Squarespace for sponsoring this episode of Three Blind Men and an Elephant. Back to the R5 and recording 8K. If, even if, it turns out that the R5's recording is theoretically unlimited, how long in practice could you record 8K 10-bit 422 footage, let alone RAW, Internally, how long would you want to record in 8K at all? Why? I'm asking with open-minded curiosity. What will be the storage and processing overheads of editing the R5's 8K raw output? Would you be willing to upgrade your editing suite to accommodate them if what you have now is insufficient? What about NLEs? Will your NLE handle it? If not, would you be willing to switch? These are the questions I ask myself. If you were willing to take on the effort and expense, why? Is 10-bit more compelling to you than 6K, even 4K, 12-bit RAW, like on the Panasonic S1H or the Nikon Zs, respectively? Maybe it's the R5's 120 frames per second 4K that really rocks you. I, I get that. The possibility that the camera might be able to super sample from 8K to 4K, is that even possible? I think it's fair to assert that even 6K video, for 99% of us, 99% of the time, is also irrelevant. Actually, more like 99.9% of us, 99.9% of the time, was only last year, for example, that global 4K TV sales eclipsed those of HD for the first time. In 2019, 8K sets accounted for just two-tenths of 1% of global TV sales. So, how confident are you that the next few years are going to be economic boom times? How confident are you that 8K resolution is what your audience or your talent want? How confident are you that YouTube, say, won't so compress the heck out of your 8K footage, there won't be that much to see between that and 4K anyway. It's already hard enough to see the difference between 8-bit and 10-bit 1080. Put differently, it seems to me that the distance between where we are at 4K and where we can be at 8K today is not nearly the storytelling nor artistic expression distance the arrival of mirrorless cameras and 4K was from 1080 30p DSLRs just half a decade ago. But again, that's just me. Though, do you remember the first year the Oscars were televised in HD? I do. I remember seeing Cameron Diaz, and to my utter astonishment, thinking some kind of Dorian Gray thing was happening right before my eyes, which is ludicrous because she was and remains a beautiful woman. That was more about shattering illusion and expectation, which is an entirely separate conversation. I also remember electronic filtering following almost immediately thereafter, the irony of which drives me nuts. Here's the bottom line. When you take a walk around the block, and I don't know about you, but there's not much else to do these days outside the house. When you take a deep breath, when you think about it deeply, when you pull a three blind men and an elephant and look at this R5 development announcement from a number of different angles and try to synthesize those perspectives, You simply have to ignore that signature 8K spec. And when you do that, the only interesting thing about the R5 is that it finally brings Canon to parity with, and in some real but far less dramatic ways, beats the current roster of 4K recording full-frame mirrorless hybrid cameras, which 
is not nearly as sexy as the hyperbole of 8K suggests. Specifically, the R5 is shaping up as the first Canon hybrid body that can functionally compete across the board stills and video with the 4K segment inhabited by the Sony A7 series, the Panasonic S1 series, the Nikon series, and the Leica SL2. Or can it? Because if that signature 8K calling card and purported 45 megapixel sensor allow Canon to successfully set the price at 3500 or more, as the chatter also suggests, then it will compete most effectively only with the S1R, S1H, Z7, and SL2, which in the real world means it won't compete all that well against the more price-sensitive end of the market inhabited by the A7 III, Nikon Z6, and Panasonic S1. Ergo, the 20 megapixel, 4K only, maybe half the price? R6. You want to scoff at 20 megapixels for video or stills? I understand. But that's just silly. For most of us, anyway. As so many others have pointed out, it works just fine for pro photographers using Canon's 1DX Mark III or Nikon's D5. It's pretty much all we need for our video work, relying primarily, as I mentioned earlier, on the Micro Four Thirds Panasonic GH5 and G9 at this point, rarely taking out our 24 megapixel APS C Sony A6400. And this is where the smoke around the R5 really clears for me. The R5 is the camera built and specced for our attention, but it's much more likely that the follow up right behind it, the R6, is what we'll buy. If Canon doesn't hobble the R6, no top panel is fine. I'm talking about things like watering down the all modes dual pixel AF and is aggressive with its pricing. If Canon does it right, the R6 will put significant pressure not only on the 24 megapixel 4K full frame segment, but dramatic pressure on the 4K crop sensor segment too. Think of it as a full-frame Panasonic GH5 or G9 or Fujifilm X-T4 with best or near best-in-class autofocus, better dynamic range, low-light performance, and, at the extreme, shallower depth of field. And the very latest lenses from arguably the best mass-market producer of lenses on Earth. Maybe. In either case, then, yeah, it's all about the glass. As in... How much better is RF glass than the best crop sensor glass? Heck, how much better is RF glass than EF glass or Sony FE mount glass or Nikkor Z mount glass? Put differently, are the differences between the RF lens line and these others in terms of artistic vision, audience requirements, return on investment, and or your personal preferences and workflow worth making the switch? Again, maybe. But maybe not. I just wish the industry had something like a thoroughly considered SEPA standard for manufacturers' MTF charts, and they use them. I wish someone like Roger Sakala over at LensRentals.com would perform his suite of MTF tests across these sets of lenses, though even then, that wouldn't tell the full story. I wish someone like my friends over at DP Review would do the same thing using their studio scene. I wish DxO Mark would do the same thing using their perceptual megapixel approach and give us a transparent way to extrapolate optical performance across different sensors, if that's even possible. But you know, I don't think it is. Come to think of it, DP Review's studio tests aren't sensor independent either. Nor is Imitest, actually. But these are big asks, and we'll just have to wait for the fullness of time for them to get to it. Of course, I did hop over to Canon's USA website before pulling this episode together. It was disappointing. The only direct comparisons I could find were the MTF charts for the 24-105 F4s. I couldn't find MTF charts for the RF versions of any of the Holy Trinity zooms, nor those primes. The MTF charts I could find were about as vague as one would dare publish. Over at DxO Mark, I spent a lot of time there, but I gave up trying to play the children's playground game of electricity in comparing the two RF lenses they did test, the 51.2 and 28-70 f2, to EF and Sony glass. First, RF glass on the 30 megapixel EOS R versus EF glass on the 30 megapixel 5D4. Then EF glass on the 50 megapixel 5D SR. Then Sony glass on the 42 megapixel A7R2 compared to all of it. I saw that the corrections of the two RF lenses were better than their EF counterparts, sometimes significantly, sometimes not. 
I saw that at 30 megapixels, there wasn't much difference in sharpness within or across each pair. But at 50 megapixels, I saw that the EF24-72.8 Mark II had more headroom than the EF51.2, its sharpness rating rising dramatically, while the 51.2s remained unchanged. I saw that the Sony 50mm 1.4's sharpness at 42 megapixels blew away the 51.2 EF on the 5DSR, even with an 8 megapixel handicap. But then I saw when the Sony was mounted on the 24 megapixel crop sensor A6000, it gave back all of that score and more, coming in below the RF 51.2 with its 6 megapixel advantage using the EOS R. For all of that effort, and I'm cutting it short with you guys, I know just about nothing from that exercise. I do know that we named the RF 51.2 our runner-up lens of the year in 2018 because I love the imagery coming out of it when paired with the R in my hand, but its autofocus was slow. I know my friend Gordon Lang over at Camera Labs recently compared the RF and EF 70-200 2.8s, and he found the optical differences to be minor as well. At a nuts and bolts level, I also know that if you add up Canon's Holy Trinity 2.8 zooms and the pair of 1.2 primes available in both mounts, one taken together, what you might consider a full kit, they weigh about the same. Actually, the RF kit comes in 6% heavier. Oh well. And two, the RF kit is priced 43% higher. Which I don't begrudge them per se. It places them in the same stratum as Sony G Master lenses, and every manufacturer has to figure out how to survive on an almost impossibly lower unit volumes. But I have nothing definitive yet to suggest that the RF lenses are, across the board, optically superior. And then there's that other fascinating announcement Canon made, as I mentioned earlier, of their $11,000 4K only recording Cinema EOS 300 Mark III with EF mount, no IBIS. No way to adapt RF glass either. Makes one wonder if Canon believes serious shooters don't need more than the current EF glass catalog to do serious work. Makes one wonder, while we're wondering, if Canon believes that internal neutral density filters, lighted controls, 120 frames per second in 4K, and 16 stops of dynamic range at base ISO using dual gain output are more important than 8K for serious work. Just saying. Which leaves us where precisely? I'll summarize it this way. Forget about 8K. Unless you truly need it in the way that the R5 may be able to provide it, though we don't know yet what that means. Instead, let's give credit where credit is due. Considered at 4K only, and as I said earlier, assuming no footnotes or provisos when the production R5 arrives, it is shaping up as the ticket for anyone looking for a full-frame, full-blown hybrid alternative to the still-dominant Sonys. Superior 4K, better ergos, better build quality, better suited to work with legacy Canon EF glass. Maybe better IBIS, I sure hope so. Maybe better dynamic range, if the Canon C300 Mark III is any indication, though if you light, it doesn't much matter. Autofocus almost as good, perhaps with a firmware release or two as good as the Sonys. But most of us can forget about the R5 even then because it's the R6, as I said, that will likely be the more relevant camera for most of us. Especially since, depending on price, the R6 may be deeply unsettling to Panasonic and Fujifilm crop sensor fans as well. In the end, I think it really does just come down to price and the glass. Candidly, our interest in the R system will remain gated by the absence of 24, 35, 50, and 90 millimeter moderately fast, moderately priced, optically superb primes like the ones Nikon already has out in the marketplace with their Nikkor Zs. But that's just us. What do you think? In the meantime, we'll continue to do what we do with what we've got. Because there's nothing we want to do that we can't do with what we have. That sounds familiar. Thanks again to Squarespace.com for making this episode of Three Blind Men and an Elephant possible. For all of your website needs, if you're a small or mid-sized business, a solopreneur, Squarespace is the place to go. Get your free, no-strings-attached 14-day trial at www.squarespace.com. And if at the end you decide you really love it and are ready to go for it, save 10% by using the discount code HUE at checkout.